Hello and welcome to this episode of Fintech Focus TV, brought to you by Harrington Star, global leaders in financial technology recruitment. Head over to the Harrington Star website today where you'll be able to download our brand new documentary, The Era of Convergence, which charts the merger of traditional and decentralized finance. You'll also be able to see our new magazine, The Financial Technologist, with the Top 1% Workplace Awards. Enjoy the show and we'll see you soon. Hello and welcome to another episode of Fintech Focus TV with me, Toby Babb. Today, I am transporting you all out of the way out to LA and really delighted to introduce you to Rodney Williams from Solo Funds. Solo Funds is a business I've just found out about recently, been learning more and more about it and getting more and more excited as, I, as I've been doing it as the, uh, the conversation we've had in the preamble beforehand sounds really interesting as well. So we've got a treat for you viewers today, looking forward to this one. Rodney's got loads to talk about, we're going to get into it all, but before we do that, Rodney, lovely to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on board. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk. It's an absolute pleasure. So let, let's start with the exciting bit. Tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us about Solo Funds and, uh, and what you guys are doing over there. So prior to Solo, I um, founded a company called Listener, um, which is still active today. Um, and then prior to that, I was actually a brand manager at Procter & Gamble. But you know, while I was at my previous venture, um, I really had a pain point alongside my co-founder, Travis Holloway, where our friends and family requested access to short-term loans. And, you know, it was our friends and family asking for $50 for gas or a few hundred dollars to pay a, a utility bill. And when we double-clicked that problem, it was a much bigger problem than just our friends and family. What we discovered was that and most Americans uh, couldn't didn't have much savings, so they couldn't afford emergencies. And unplanned expense or emergencies happen in, in everyday's lives all the time, right? It's the, the flat tire that you weren't thinking about. It's the medical bill that you weren't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't know that all of a sudden you were going to have this procedure uh, and all of a sudden something's different. And, 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 and so there was a combination of things that may happen from an emergency standpoint. And what do you do when you have an emergency? Who do you call on? Conceptually, we felt that people can help people throughout these, um, or kind of like, uh, evolve out of these emergency situations. And that was the premise for, for Solo, where members are supporting members. Uh, on, one, on one side, you have members who can make a request, um, request on all of their own terms, 100% optional fee structure. And on the other side, you have a member like you and I that could lend um, maybe to make an impact or to potentially make a return. And, mm -hmm. and that's what uh, obviously makes what I think we do special. That's, that's an incredible sort of uh, concept as well. And I love the fact of your background not being necessarily as as uh, as orthodox as you might see in certain fintechs. Uh, yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people come from you know, product backgrounds, from sales backgrounds, and a lot of obviously naturally from technology backgrounds uh, within this space. The sort of brand manager at Procter & Gamble isn't you know, the uh, the classic sort of pathway in, in, into everything. But what is classic about what you said is, Here's a problem. As an entrepreneur, I'm keen to find the you know find the solution to it. And I love the fact it's sort of scratching that itch and finding out it's not it's bigger than than what you originally found out, and then moving it further forward. You mentioned there a little while ago as well about you know what you're doing and and what your your proposition is and what you're trying to solve. Tell me a little bit about you know with with a number of different businesses in the space and and you know that peer to peer and, and the membership side of things isn't unique in itself. Some of the things you're doing, uh, uh, you know, absolutely allow that to, to be unique. Tell us what's making you guys stand out at the moment, because you're getting all sorts of acclaim as well. I've been reading about some of the uh, the rap sheet there of, uh, of, the, of the good and great that you've been uh, you know, uh, under at the moment. It seems to be working pretty well for you. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, 7, 10, 15 years, you name it, at different points in, in FinTech history, peer-to-peer -peer was definitely... Um, held as the saver. I, I like to call it the, the original decentralized finance or democratization of finance, where we're going to, the people, it was the original people ple uh, people product, right? Before crypto yeah, yeah. and blockchain. And it never really amounted to, to what everyone thought it would. And, and that's been the general consensus of peer-to-peer -peer as a business model. And then all of a sudden, Solo comes in and it's doing something very, very different or our traction is very, very different, right? And what, what we discovered or what we took, um, the historical peer-to-peer -to -peer 
models of our past didn't necessarily focus on unplanned or emergency expenses. It, it, they planned, they were much more larger loans, longer duration loans, loans mm. for refinance. That's also a very different type of borrower. That's a prime or better borrower. We took a lot of the things that they did and said, no, we're going to focus on the bottom of the market. We're going to focus on short term. And it was really not because we didn't want to do peer to peer. It was really around looking at that original problem that I said and said, mm. hey, we need access to capital that's non-institutional so that we can underwrite uniquely. It was to solve, it's, you know, because again, if you're, if you're taking institutional capital, it's essentially, this, this, it's all, you're, it's like you're following the same legacy system, right? Yeah. Versus if we have capital that's a little bit, like we wanted the ability to, to have a, a unique capital pool so that we can underwrite uniquely and then we can deploy it uniquely. And, and, and that, that was one of the reasons why we went peer to peer, but the major difference that has caused us to, to succeed where we think others haven't was focusing on that bar, focusing on short term. We also don't co-mingle the capital. So for example, you know, if I'm lending to Mike, it's a direct one-to-one -one scenario. The short term nature and the ability to underwrite using technology and cash flow, what has ultimately, what we've unlocked is really strong returns for our lenders we have and so our lenders are growing rapidly right meaning you know the cost to acquire them is on a decline and it's been like that for three years mm -hmm. um and it's the same on the borrower side right now you can literally hear about us in a barber shop or hear about us on the side of the road download the app and on average money is in your account in less than 15 minutes that is not mm -hmm. a system that is someone actually lending you that capital so think about this, what have we created? All of a sudden, whatever peer-to-peer -peer was in, in the past, we're probably more like Uber for loans. We're probably <laughs> more like Airbnb for loans, right? You got like people making a request, I need cash for a hurricane expense, or I need to move, or my daughter is sick and now I gotta stay home. And then some person across the country funds them in, in minutes. And, and, and that's, that's then, then all of a sudden, it's something very, very different. And something very very unique there was a, a wonderful book i read last year um called the membership economy uh and it talks about the sort of rise of this sort of sort of you know, membership based subscriptions and, and community based subscriptions that i think is so powerful right because this is a something there where people can be part of something you know that they uh and i, and I guess look you you said it there yourself you know the, the, i guess the testament to a membership based business is is how organically it grows and how it takes off and how people are moving. Talk to us about how that's worked for you, because I think that sounds pretty special so far, right? Oh, yeah. I think that's one of our biggest things that we saw since day one, you know, investors and everyone was like, oh, what you're doing is not different. And, you know, everyone, everyone is bright and smart until they're not bright and smart, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and what we kept saying was like, no, we're growing differently. I, you know, I'm a two, I'm a, I'm a previous founder. I, the, the product market fit that we saw since day one was dramatically different. Um, so, I mean, just going to give you perspective right now, 70% of our traffic is organic and it's growing. So when you looked at us for three years ago, it was only 40%. Yeah. Like what is going on? It's, 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 it's growing more. We, we, we haven't announced our celebrity investors. We, we don't spend much significant capital on media, but we continue to grow. And that's the network effect of the marketplace, right? And I give an example. Um, in, in Uber's best day, if you took a successful ride at Uber, your first ride, you kind of went home and you told everybody, oh my God, a black car came and picked me up. It was, it was phenomenal. Some people you spoke to became drivers yeah. or a few, but most became riders automatically. Because it's just like, it had like mass appeal. What we're learning is solo has a lot of mass appeal. When you think about that mom who gets that loan, she goes and tells her whole family. Some become borrowers, but someone in the room goes, wait a minute, lending sounds like a good way to create yield. And I'll get to the, the other problem that we're addressing because uh, I spent a lot of time talking about the borrower problem, but there's a, there's a big lender problem. There's a large population of consumers who aren't getting the best financial products because they don't have enough assets to manage. So mm. for example, I, I remember when Goldman Sachs called me up and say, Rodney, you're doing well enough 
now can I manage your money? And I was like, wow, this is incredible. And they have a suite of services and products that make me more, make more money. When I had only $2,000 in my bank account, no one called me. Bank of America, Chase, no one called me. And, 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 and there weren't my, it wasn't creating yield. When you think about our product, someone with $2,000, the average American with, with small amounts of savings can lend it on this marketplace multiple times in a given month and all of a sudden make yield. All mm. of a sudden that $2,000 can grow at the end of the year and, and grow pretty substantially. And that's what that's the power of community finance. It's, it's not just about the borrower, it's also about who, the, the other member. Mm. And have you created a cycle um, where the community always wins? And, and that's also, I, I think what I, I believe is an incredibly unique perspective for us. Talk, talk to me about that. I mean, you mentioned the sort of changing uh, view of uh, of Goldman Sachs, et cetera, in, in uh, their their approach to you. But it, you also highlighted beforehand about the, the sort of changing view of investors and uh, you know, being smart until they're not, I think, at, at some sort of stage. So when you're first pushing this sort of idea, I imagine that you know, it's a little bit new, it's groundbreaking. People are scratching their heads and saying, yeah, well, and, and you know, particularly when you talk about P2P and what's the take up and is you know this there's a new decentralized finance in town etc cetera, etc cetera. tell me I know, I know you've raised uh, subsequently from what I, what I understand um yeah tell me tell me about what changed and how that happened and and uh, and what it looks like actually mapping out for you for moving further forward as well because this has got real seismic opportunity behind it right a massive opportunity and and I think that's one of the biggest things is that you know what we've unlocked it's, it's somewhere in the U.S. alone, a 40 to a $90 billion opportunity just on the borrower side. You think about our lending side. Yeah. The, the group of Americans who have that couple thousand dollars and, they're, and, and it's not being, it's, they're not creating yield. That, that's a huge, that's 56 million of that, those types of consumers um, that, that, are, that are technically not being banked correctly either. And all of a sudden, we've created a marketplace where we put these folks together. And guess what they're ultimately also doing? They're starting consumer deposit accounts with us. Mm. So there's like technically we're their bank or we aspire to, to, to continue to assist them in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a large other, uh, other banking features. But, you know, as it relates to, to, to investors and, and perception, you know, that's that's the unique perspective that I think represented, you know, founders that come from other backgrounds tend to tend to to tend to tend to have. Um, you know, being a, a, a PNG brand marketer, you know, the, the brand team runs the brand and we own the consumer and we and, and I actually was a brand manager at Pampers. I still don't have a baby, right? But <laughs> um, what made me good at it was understanding the human insight of, of motherhood at that particular moment in time and providing a solution that like relentlessly delivers, right? Yeah. And, and I think that's it, right? So like for me, when I looked at where we are today in this model and you know, with investors not necessarily understanding, I just, I, I figured, we, we both figured, my co-founder and I, that we just knew something they didn't. And, and it's because we, we came from those communities. It's because our moms and dads are still in those communities. Our aunts are in those communities. So, you know, when we don't, we don't get to la shut the laptop and solo turns off. No, we shut the laptop and I may get a call. I mean, I actually, no, I have a cousin right now who her daughter wants to do something and they, where they were saving for, to pay for like a track camp or something. Mm -hmm. And something emergency happened. And that few hundred dollars that was being saved for track camp is gone. They're like, hey, can anyone give me two hundred dollars so that I can help my daughter go to track camp? These are the, these are the things that we live. So we understand that this like a credit card is not the answer because she needs it by the end of the day, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's not like a cash advance. Um, no, like coming getting early pay. Her pay is already planned. So her paycheck that comes at the end of the week that's six hundred dollars. It's already accounted for. If I pull it up ahead of time, you don't do anything but like reshuffle around. So the entire cash advance or earn wage industry is not the solution here. The entire credit card industry is not an industry. Where, where, the only place in the, in that you can go and get a loan that quickly 
is that you got to go like take your watch off and go to a pawn shop and go sell it. Or you got to go take your title and go get a title loan. Or you got to go to a payday loan. No one has reinvented emergency or what we call on-demand capital. That's technically what we've done. It's Mm. on-demand. You wake up, something happens, you go to the app, you tell them what you need, and someone funds you. And, and, and that's, that's a, it's a lot of newness wrapped into a lot of oldness, but I think this concept of on-demand capital is new and unique. I think this concept of community finance is new and unique, um, and, or at least the way in which we're doing it. So when, when investors are first hearing it, they, they have their opinion, but I, I think they're all kind of waking up. And, I, and I'll leave with one performance that we, we have raised, we have made more money in revenue than what we've raised. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and that's, that's what we've had to do. And that, it's not by choice. You know, we, every day we, we read about a company that's raising 50 to a hundred million dollars and, and they're not, they don't have the users we have or the revenue we have, but they're doing buy now pay letter for pet medical stuff, or they're doing, they, they're doing whatever the hot FinTech thing is. And, and number one, it's like no fucking passion there. Sorry for my language. No passion there. No, That's there's no purpose you're, there. you're allowed to when you got passion in there. <laughs> yeah, you know, like what are you doing that for? Like, I'm a two-time founder. My my first company was my of Visa. I I I could have started a buy now pay later company. I could have started a an an, an asset based lending platform. I could have started everything that fit the trend so that I can go out and get the money. But it was not the right solution for the problem, a huge problem. And 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 I, and I wish investors and stakeholders in the industry would go back to, to problem fixing, and more yeah. so versus like, um, uh, uh, business model, hot business models. Like someone comes to me with another NFT or crypto or DAO, and you're not talking to me about what you're trying to fix. I don't want to hear it. It's yeah. irrelevant and it's a trend, and uh, I don't do trendy things. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I think there's a really interesting thing you spoke about there from from your background as well and that brand background because it's the same you know it, it sort of goes with that sort of product play doesn't it where you're sat there and by nature you're looking at at the product and what it does for the for who you're looking to serve and i think that's a big big difference from most founders who are sat there saying right we we're, we've got a problem here and we're going to tell everyone about how clever we're we're you know creating you know we're almost creating issues that aren't there but this is an, an actual thing which is there and being lived and I think it's a really interesting part about, you know, in, in an area there, which has got, you know, if you, if you think about it, about payday loans and such, like it's got such a bad reputation uh, and it's created so many problems on top of, the, you know, the, the issues that it's solved. What you're talking about here is, is being part of an issue and actually creating real uh, opportunities for people, solving real problems and, and getting things done, done for it. There are two questions I want to, I, I want to focus in on. Number one is, is, yeah, you know, when you're talking about your space, there's a lot of problems with uh, with regulators or, or a lot of hurdles to jump with regulators. And regulators, a similar way to what you've just been speaking about with investors, sometimes are a little bit detracted from the issue itself. So I think that I'm interested to see how you're dealing with that too. And then I'm also interested to hear about your dealing with stigma. Because when you're talking about that sort of area, there's a natural de- uh, distrust, I think, around, uh, you know, yeah, let, let's take it. It will knock on from that payday loan piece. So when it's coming in there and people need money fast, and they're getting that money, usually they're sat there and there's a you know, there's a little uh, fing- fingers crossed behind the back and a concern that they're gonna you know they're gonna be paying through the nose for a long time and it can cause all sorts of financial spiral for that. You're completely away from that sort of world. So I really want you to dig into that side of things well. So catch the regulator piece first, and then we'll move on to that little bit there about how you're making sure that this is something that everyone wins from as opposed to just those with the money. Yeah, um, it's so many that things I want to say. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. Well, number one, I'll talk about it, right? Regulators as a whole need to represent the consumers they're trying to protect. Yeah. And, and that means first, that means first, they need to find solutions to the problems that consumers are facing, not trying to find problems that the consumers are facing. There's a big difference there, right? Very big difference. But that that's again, you know, they're not, they don't when they when they look at like a mortgage company, it's all about are you following the rules? They're not saying, I need to validate that underserved communities are getting mortgages. Why aren't they getting mortgages? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
That's the bigger problem. Yeah. No, that's the bigger problem, right? But but again, that's the difference between because a, a lot of these regulators are actually well educated. To, to be so, number one, to be a regulator, especially you got to be. It, it, you, you mostly don't really care about your salary. So you usually come from a, like a well-off family because um, you went to Harvard or something and you said, I'm going to give back. I'm going to go work for the government. and be. That's not an option for someone who's like from a poor family. Like that's not an option. You made it to Harvard or you made it to a good law school. You got to go to a, a top firm because there's a, a lot of people behind you that need your support. So anyway, the entire that that's a whole different thing. I'll go off on a tangent. <laughs> but... Number one, the, that's kind of how regulators think. And, 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 and when we talk about this problem in particular, the only real solution that has been regulated is kind of this, these, con, these, you know, in the short-term category, the concept of short-term personal loan has negative stigma, as you say, which is, un, is, un, is I, I personally think that's a problem. First of all, the mm -hmm. entire financial industry can, has enough corruption in, and, and evidence of discriminatory practices to have stigma on it. It's, it's not specific to short-term loans. Now, the other thing about that is that, you know, we say, well, if you were to remove payday loans, that there would be no, no short-term product. Mm. When, 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 when regulators started to heavily regulate it, they, they didn't provide an alternative. <laughs> they didn't say, this is, the, this, is, this, is the, this, is, this is how you should operate. Right. They just didn't. So, you know, you know, when you talk to consumers in these neighborhoods where they tend to, to leverage these type of products, do they think it's predatory? Yes. Do they try to avoid them? Yes. But if it's if it's take this loan or in some instance, like my kids don't get fed <laughs> or I my car doesn't get fixed so I don't go to work, so I lose my job and I lose my yeah. benefits, then the, uh, the opportunity cost of not taking it is significantly outweighs the predatory cost of taking it. And if you're a regulator and you don't understand the difference between the two, you have missed why it needs to exist. Now, that's yeah. one piece. And not that I'm even an advocate of payday loans. I just know that's the only thing there. And I know regardless of how predatory they may be, I have had family members think about the two choices. There's literally three choices. It was like, you know, do I take a payday loan? Do I sell something? Like, what can I sell? Like, my mom, like, what can I get rid of? And the third yeah. thing is, like, I'm going to go take it. Like, yeah. I'm going to go resort to a crime that I normally wouldn't do. Right. Yeah. And these are these are really things that we, we, we need to be honest with, you, with ourselves about. Now, as we kind of get to what we do today and where can we make space for that? And, and, I, and I would tell you for us, back to my point, like I'm, I'm just I'm trying to, you know, deliver on a problem, a solution, a real solution. I don't want to do what everyone else did. <laughs> right. I saw a problem and I saw a old business model in peer to peer and I saw some old things. And I said, I think if you put them all together, it could be unique. Right. And I think we could provide, provide a solution here there. And, and, and everything that we did was designed for the solution. We didn't design everything, anything to appease a stakeholder or not it's about the solution. So for example, there's a, you know, our, um, our fee structure does not follow the standards of the industry. There's no APR, there's no subscription fee, there's no transaction fees, there's no mandatory fees. All fees are 100% optional. Why did we do that? Again, individuals in these communities are always being told what to do. They're told yes and no. Um, the, if you, if you ever talk to them, one of the most psychologically semi-painful thing is going and get a loan or trying to get a loan because it's grown a custom that it does, they get denied. It's like a mm. continual cycle of denial. So, um, this group doesn't necessarily feel empowered when they go to a financial institution or connect to a financial institution, they feel a bit of insecurity. So cool. for us, it was that number one. And number two, we also understood that they don't really understand. And I give you an example. I, 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 this was my point. The first time I bought a house, I was like, great. Oh my God, I got a great interest rate. 
two percent APR. Life is good. And then as I as I closed, there was like origination costs and buyer's fee and seller's fee. Mm-hmm. I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. This thing is costing me an extra whatever. The, the APR is not the total cost. Mm. So where, where so they get back to predatory. Where does payday loans make the majority of their money? The additional cost. Where does the banking industry get their money? Additional cost. What's the difference between, so for example, late fees are not calculated in the APR. But again, if if this company charges a 10% late fee versus um, if if I'm at my bank and it's, I, it's overdrawn by $10, there's an overdraft fee of $35. But no one looks at that $35 as an APR of the $10 that the bank fronted for me. And no one looks at the predatory or the, the payday loan for the 10%. Because those are late fees. And when you talk to these consumers, they don't have a problem with APR. They have a problem with all of the other fees that penalize them when something goes wrong and it spirals them out of control. So when you start to give users the ability to, 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 to be empowered, make their, they select their own costs. There's no miscommunication about what, what the loan, how much loan is. They're like, mm. oh, no. I requested $100 and I'm only going to pay $10 more. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I self-selected it. <laughs> like, that's what they say. They're like, oh, no, I self-selected it. There's no, it, the, we have literally, there's no consumer complaints about our consumers not understanding what to pay. That's like yeah. super rare. We've done nearly 450,000 loans. You're telling me? And, 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 and so that's what was important. And yeah, yeah. again, as we were solutioning, these were like some of the things that we were doing that honestly no one had done in the industry. When we were telling investors that we were going to have an optional fee structure, they were like, no one's going to pay anything. This is going to be stupid. This doesn't work. And what? Yeah, like they were so confused. You're leaving money on the table. Is it the right thing for the consumer? It's black and white with me. It's yes or no. Yeah. <laughs> right. So as you get into regulators, regulators are also baffled by it, right? They're like, oh, these guys got to be doing something wrong. It can't be 100% optional because everyone's paying it. That's not a good reason. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, 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 that's what you're going to be mad about. You're going to be mad that, hey, it's not 100% optional because someone's paying it. Like, you're just mad at the product market fit. Or, or you're <laughs> mad that it worked. Or, but again, you haven't, I, when I talk to regulators, I'm still upset, especially ones that overanalyze us. They're not asking the right questions. How many yeah. consumers are happy? How many people did we save from opportunity costs? How much money are we saving them over time? Like these are the, like, like 30% of our borrowers end up becoming lending members. This is a really interesting piece, isn't it as well? Because you're talking here about things that are right for the consumer, which is 100% you know, the, the, the valiant thing to, to be looking at. And, and then, you know, as you say, investors are looking at it and saying, how's this work as a business model? You're going to you're leaving money on the table, all those different things that, that, that the money guys are going to be looking at when they're talking to a, you know, to a business within it. But often doing the right thing is the right thing. Um, and that then has a return where you make more than if you if you've been trying to rinse every penny out of the and squeeze the lemon as hard as you possibly can. How's that working for you commercially? Yeah, it's working wonderful. So like I'm definitely in that camp. Right. So we are the only black led fintech that's a benefit corporation in Canada or the US. Years before I started this company, I got a chance to, to see the founders of B Corp and some early founders in the, in the kind of B Corp world, like Patagonia, a lot of like the companies that were like part of like the early days of it. And I'm a firm believer that you can do well and do good, right? I, I think there are business models like that. I think, and I think financial service industry, especially if you're going to go after a community that has been marginalized, you can do that. And it can be a competitive advantage. Our, our c- concept was, I've never wanted to buy a JP Morgan Chase shirt <laughs> and wear it around. <laughs> never. <laughs> I can't see I can't see the logo on that one. I was thinking it might be JP Morgan or Chase. <laughs> yeah, totally not. It's one of my friends' startups. Um, uh, okay, I would never do that. But um, we sell out of what we call our merch. This tiny company, we make t-shirts and our members buy them. Yeah. They're so proud 
to wear solo. Yeah. And that's the difference. That's the competitive advantage. That's the go-to-market strategy. That's the marketing. You will not see anything on our website about an APR or fast cash, get money now, apply. We don't like those things. This market doesn't like those things. That's 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 the old way. This is people helping people. We got your back. Everybody has access, right? And when you come in and you get access, you make a request and you don't get funded, we're going to help you get funded the next time. We're going to give you the credit tools, the financial literacy. We're going to onboard you. We're going to start taking your direct deposit and start telling you how to get to the place you want to be. This is this is community finance. Um, everybody wins at Solo. And that's kind of like we win together, right? And 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 that type of and we when you go to the app too, there's no differentiation. Like there's one app. You're a lender or a borrower. You see the same thing. It was super important psychologically for us to do that because we believe they're the same people, and we're actually right. That's why 30% of our borrowers are in lenders. They're the same person. When I looked at my aunt, she had a college degree. She had a good job. She has a she has a, a not well paying job, meaning you know she's a she's a government employee. She works at the post office. That's not that you're not gonna you know you're not gonna get blow the socks off in the salary. But again, that person in in a, in a city with a high cost of living just needs to 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 manage their finances. But guess what happens to someone like my aunt? Eventually, they get promoted. Eventually, mm. they start making more. Eventually, become managers and supervisors, and all of a sudden. They're different. And let's not let the first 10 years of their professional career, 15 years, completely demolish the fact that they're going to have a 30 year career one day. Um, and yes, they're not going to make as much as a doctor or someone else, but at some point they're going to make money to, to actually live pretty well. And we're going to continue to be with them along that journey. And your lenders, I mean, this is another interesting part. You're talking about the sort of success and the yield that they're getting from, from doing this, this as well. This is an exciting aspect for, for, for those people too, because you're looking at something transformational here. You're looking at something which, as you say, everybody wins, you're doing good. Uh, at, the, at the same time, time you, you know, you've got a solution to a, to a genuine, genuine problem out there that doesn't do it by you know, capitalizing on the misery of other people or the desperation or the situation of other people. Tell us about how the, how the lenders win here. Yeah, wait, wait, and, and who, who they are? Is, is there a, is there a traditional sort of background for that for that sort of lender? Is you know who's getting involved as well? We look at like a journey, a life journey. Um, all of our borrowers had the potential to be lenders one day. Yeah, put it that way. Yeah. Um, they're not far removed. But I, I'll tell you who they generally are today. They tend to be between seventy five and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. They're early in their career. So they went to college, they may be like a year one analyst or year one engineer, or they're a little bit later in their career, like they're a pastor or they're uh, the, the manager at a, mechan- a car shop. Um, but, but they tend to be in that salary bucket. Where they, what also is interesting is that they tend to still live in underserved zip codes. So they live in zip codes where the, it's not the nicest part of town, right? Because they still can't afford the nicest part of town yet. They tend to have the nice apartment or the nice home on mm. the not so great block, right? Mm. So if you think about that, they wake up every day and they see people that need access to capital. Mm. Like they, they walk into the coffee shop, the barista is the borrower and the person who's buying the coffee is the lender. That's, mm. we like to think that's, that's what, that's happened. But that's an original point that the kind of commonality between our lenders is that they now have discretionary capital. They now have a few thousand dollars of money sitting in a savings account that's absolutely not creating any yield for them. And they, they've, been, they've, had, they've had a ton of promises. They were promised that Bitcoin was going to allow them to make a bunch of money, and they lost it. So that someone told them to go buy yeah. GameStop, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and they lost it. <laughs> Came off right? them fussy. <laughs> right? And, and because these were platforms that like tried to... like. To someone having two thousand dollars in a bank account five years ago, never thought I could invest in the stock market. Today, they they like, oh my, they're, they're like, I want to turn two thousand dollars into twenty five hundred dollars. Like, how do I do that? Yeah. And and then a bitch. So like, they're looking for it now. And then they come to solo, and they're like, wait a minute, I've been lending all my life. Like, we know how to lend, generally speaking. And and so, what makes it special is that um, the 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 average 
repayment of these loans are, are, are repaid back within 14 days. So if you can imagine, if I have $2,000, I can lend it twice in 30 days time period. All of a sudden, that's 4,000 lending power in a monthly. All of a sudden, you can do that 12 times in a given year. So your $2,000 has turned into $48,000 of lending capacity. Now, granted, even if you're only making a small um, amount on a per loan basis, the fact that it's technically $48,000 in a short term, that's what equates to a high annual yield. And that's mm. what's special. That's what's special is that we allow people to have to test $2,000 to make 20% annually because of that nature. That's a big impact for them. Like Massive. you're talking about people, a consumer who their entire Christmas budget is $500, right? Yeah, yeah. And I have just, incre- like I've, I've made Christmas easier. Yeah. So I, like, again, I wish the regulators understood it that way. Cause that's how, what I think. I was like, oh my God. Everyone's like, oh, this is small. This is pennies. This is peas and carrots. And I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> this yeah, is yeah, yeah. massive. This yeah. is massive. So that's, that's, that's the special Especially part. when you see the scalability of it. I mean, you, you look at the problem and you look at everything that's going on economically all over the world. You know, at the moment, the grip it's having on households and everything in between. This is something which, which, you know, which can create so much for so many different people. I love it. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm looking at here and I'm on the clock. I know with you today for this episode, and I feel like I, we, we scratched a, a fraction of everything I want to talk, talk about. So this is, this is definitely a part two coming up on this, on this one, because I've, I've loved everything you've been talking about. But I want to finish um, with a little bit more. You're, you're on this journey uh, and you're doing some incredible things at the moment. You're getting all sorts of accolades and recognition and everything's moving in the right direction uh, for you and the business. Tell us about what the next year looks like. This will be coming out at the end of, of 2022. 2023 has got your uncertainty across fintech. It's got uncertainty across the economies of, of every major country in, in the world. Uh, but it sounds like you've got a plan there that's going to uh, um, you know, turn that negative into a positive. Tell us what 2023 looks like for you guys. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 super thankful for 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 the investors and the team um, and the work that we've done thus far. Nothing has gone as planned, except for the <laughs> fact that we continue to grow. <laughs> Nothing goes as planned, right? You know, negative press from regulatory or positive. Nothing goes as planned, except for the fact that it continues to grow. You know, I used to say we're going to do all this stuff. I'm just going to leave with something basic. We're going to continue to help the people that need it. And then help people grow from it, and 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 that's all we've always done consistently, and that's what I know we will continue to do. And it sounds like there's going to be a few easier Christmases this year as well, thanks to you. That must be the beard, right? <laughs> <laughs> it must be. It must be the beard. Uh, I, I I know when when my nieces and nephews start to say, "Hey, you should wear the Christmas out Santa's outfit," I'm like, "Wait a minute," you know, like. Your uncle's still the cool guy, you know what I mean? Like, not that. So, bear with me. <laughs> Rodney, this has been an absolute joy. It's been one of my favorite episodes we've done so far. I think there's so many good things that you're, you're doing. It's so exciting to do more. Promise me you'll come back on the show and talk us a little bit more about the journey. I think there's so much. We've taken just a fraction of everything so far. Will you come back on? Awesome. We'll always come back on. We'll always be uh, happy here. So it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Absolutely. Likewise. Thanks so much for it. If people are out there listening to this and, and you know, they want to get involved as borrowers or less, uh, in, in investors or lenders or whatever that comes into it, what's the best way they're getting in touch with you? Honestly, just head to solofunds.com and shoot us a message. Um, I, I tend to be active on social media uh, um, at Rodney B. Williams. Please message me. Um, we need this, all the support, right? Community finance wins with the, with the community part. So please join us. Good man. Rodney, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for joining us on the show. And thank you all for watching. We will see you soon on another episode of Fintech Focus TV. Thanks a lot.